I'll start a little bit with how I met Duran was over his, um, it was a remarkable to see a young man of color discussing not only food, which is, you know, something I would kind of expect out there, uh, and chefness and gardenness and all of those things that are all really relevant, but always tying them back into politics and how the world seems to be working and uh, who, who we need to be, you know, follow the money and who do we need to be looking at uh, instead of blaming uh, ourselves. I mean, sometimes, yes, we do fuck up and it's our, and it's our fault. But there's other times, in fact, a great many times when what it is we're doing and reacting to is actually from that larger outside world of politics where you one is if they if they and i hate that kind of inference but if the larger political world can convince you to think a certain way it is to their advantage for you to think that or to get distracted by that or get mired down in that whatever the that is um it was very um, refreshing to have a person who was always trying to connect those things to the practical, which is um, what are you going to eat tomorrow and who's going to eat what and what services are available and things like that. Um, because if you get too down in the weeds, it's easy to miss the larger picture and if you get too out into the larger picture it's really easy to miss the the real practical stuff of, of as my son says what are you going to do on monday uh, and so uh, following Duran, i was really um, encouraged to see first of all a very urban person and I live out in the country and except with, it, with a few exceptions for the last most 45 years, I have lived uh, without sidewalks and without street lights and on uh, uh, acreage of some sort or a farm. So I'm not always, um, I'm not always as interested in people who, do, who are really urban because they often are not very interesting, to be perfectly frank. They're kind of engaged with a lot of stuff that uh, doesn't interest me. And I found Duran to be a, uh, very interesting. And so when I had a chance to go to um, the Ginter Gardens, where I had given a talk at one time a couple of years before that with, um, um, oh, God, don't tell me I'm going to forget her name. Karen uh, wonderful Karen Washington. No, um, black woman who went out to Minnesota, um, and maybe her name will come back to me. Anyway, she gave a wonderful talk, and I gave a talk, and we got to talking anyway. And so that was kind of my first real uh, look at some potentials for urban gardening, and ur and more than urban gardening, urban food provisioning urban food politics how that all what the hell are you doing i'm about to, I'm about to mute my phone while i look while i get my uh charger so my phone doesn't my computer, my computer. I'm, I'm sorry everybody i just saw his butt show up in the damn camera and wondered what the hell he was doing um i've been uh at at one time a, a, a very um uh, uh, very, uh, 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 how would you say it? I was a farmer. My husband and I farmed his grandfather's 160 acre homestead land in South Dakota. And I milked five cows and we had 10 sows and um, uh, four stock cows. And I raised 500 chickens a year to be butchered and uh, had 50 laying hens and uh, you know, a lot in a huge garden. I've had that experience with large production of food. Over the last long time now, I've lived on five acres and basically raised the kinds of foodstuffs that support my family. 
uh, my husband died three years ago, so now it's really me and my local, my children who live locally. I'm kind of the hub. I'm the food hub. All of that, to me, ties into what has also been about a 35-year um, uh, career as a lecturer and historian and consultant about issues that have to do with American slavery, of which, of course, food and food production and all of that ties in. So that's in many ways how I've come to do that. I've worked in a lot of historic house kitchens, um, cooking, and so I have, um, uh, I've cooked on the hearth and I've cooked on an open fire. And then for many years, I cooked on a wood cook stove uh, in my home. Uh, I'm, I'm always interested in food and I'm interested in food on a lot of levels, which is why I was so uh, delighted to meet Duran and I'm delighted to meet this whole aggregate of y'all uh, because it sounds like if you're, you know, if, if you're interested in what he's interested in, then I'm interested in y'all. So there, there I am at this point. If you have, uh, I don't know, any particular questions or some place you'd like me to jump off from, I'd be glad to do that. No, I'm on a, a call, but I'm on mute. Who is this? I see a woman with glasses and a glasses string holding her glasses with gray hair. Hi. 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 So let's start, let's start, Lenny, with, 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 with your work over um, at Monticello. Like, how did you end up there and what did you do <clears> there? <throat> like, what was, the, what, was that, what was that experience about in a, in a, in a so summation? When I first came to it, when I first came to Virginia in, 80, in 82, December of 82, um, the thing, I came off the farm. My husband and I were um, essentially closed off the farm by the Farm Home Administration when they closed out all the farm home loans under $160,000 in Eastern South Dakota. So we were given, uh, to finish out the rest of the season, we were for, we were growing uh, edible beans, uh, pinto beans and navy beans. Uh, and like I said, I had cows and, and did. And in South Dakota, you can sell anything off your farm as long as people come to you to get it. So I was selling bread and yogurt and milk and eggs and chickens and pork and um, lamb. And we were doing a lot of butchering. And um, when I moved to Virginia, you know, none of that is happening. This is a, what I always call a stainless steel oligarchy state. You know, where all the big guys don't want any little guys, you know, to, um, to make any money. And uh, I, but what I brought with me was 128 pounds of wool because I had 12 sheep that had just been sheared and I needed to sell this wool. So I put out the call to find some spinners and I, got 14 people ended up at my house in Free Union, uh, Alma County. And one of them worked at Ash Lawn, which as you probably know, is a historic house uh, just uh, down the road from Monticello. And I went there, because uh, she said, oh, you'd be perfect as a crafter, interpreter, whatever, because I knew how to spin and I knew how to weave and I knew how to cook and blah, blah, blah. So I went there and I got a job and I was, the resident black person, which was really interesting because I was in costume and I uh, was sad and for a long time I was spinning and stuff. And so, of course, because I've always been a reader, I've always been a potential historian, I was really talking about the enslaved, who, of course, did all the fucking work, you know. So I was really talking about it from that point of view, not so much demonstrating how to spin. You know, I mean, you want to do that, just go take a damn class. But using the wheel and the wool as kind of, as a material culture hook to get people to stop and listen, 
Okay, so then I could really then talk about what I really wanted to talk about, which is the women who did the spinning and why did they do it and why did they have to do it and what did they do with it when they were done with it and how much of it was theirs and how much of it was, wasn't theirs and what was textiles like, who was selling textiles, who was buying textiles at the time, um, uh, what were clothing rations, what kind of skill did it take to know all this stuff, uh, uh, what were the differences between, say, an upper elite plantation in Virginia and a place later on uh, you know, of course, in Virginia, things were happening in the late 18th century, and so then by the, the antebellum period, how might that have shifted and changed further, further west? Uh, th those were the things I was interested in talking about, and people seemed to be interested in hearing me talk about it, so there I was, and I, I was there. Um, then the uh, Ashland decided to restore uh, the outbuildings, uh, some of which had little pieces still left, and so they decided to recreate the original outbuildings of which the out kitchen was one, and they restored it, and I got to be in the kitchen. Now, of course, I already knew how to cook on fire, and I had all kinds of cast iron tools, and I had a costume, and blah, 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 and I worked, so I worked at Ashland for five years, and I worked in the kitchen, and even more than the compelling nature of spinning wheels and wool and all that stuff, food is the great, the great thing. None of us can resist it. I mean, given look look at how in the last three weeks or four weeks, if we want to, come, the the entire internet has blown up with people with the sourdough and the gardens and the bread and the food and the you know people who haven't cooked for three years are now cooking, you know, because why? They're all their children are home. Um, people who don't know how to cook want to learn how to cook and people who, you know, what it's food just grabs us. And so in that context at Ashton, I really began to create a, uh, I, I wouldn't presume to be so, so, um, uh, to call so dignified as call, to call it a philosophy because I'm much too coarse to have a philosophy, but I do have a, opinions. <laughs> and, uh, and having raised and grown an awful lot of food myself, I always wanted to bring it down to what, what did the people who did it know in order to do it? How do you, how do you what is, um, say, farm farm wisdom, agricultural wisdom. You know, we now have a country and we've had it for quite a long time where we have had a real contempt for farmers. We want to both eulogize them with the red barns and the, you know, the little pasture and, uh, and a tractor, you know, but um, God help, we don't really want to see any people milking cows or, you know, we don't see any of the messy parts of it. And we don't want to see anything butchered or killed or whatever. We just want to have our barbecue, you know? Um, and so we, we just have this uh, very conflicted idea about who farmers are. And of course, over the last 125 years, uh, if you read, uh, you know, there's a, quite a lot of good literature out there on the transition into industrial farming, which we have to have because there's 360 million of us. There aren't enough local farms, small farms to ever sustain 360 million people. Uh, over and above the fact that we have vast tracts of land that grow wheat and basic staples that feed many people uh, in the rest of the world who... Um, uh, uh, need those items. And they're never going to be produced on small scale. They just can't. Uh, I've got five acres of which I have maybe at the most a half of an acre in cultivation. And I couldn't possibly grow enough corn for the cornmeal I use or enough wheat for the wheat that I use. Um, this isn't to say that the Shenandoah Valley doesn't have wheat land. That's really kind of what it's for. But it's too can't it just can't sustain all the people in Virginia. They're just too damn many of us. So we've had this conflict between uh, uh, feeling that industrial or capitalist investment farming is somehow wicked and 
evil and a whole bunch of other stuff. And it's, it's a pretty complicated scene and I'm kind of simplifying it a lot. But it does mean, however, that the various movements for small production that have happened in several waves since the early 1960s have been often not so much about how to feed everyone as how to find uh, often personal uh, develop, what, develop mental ways of life to, to have a family or to do. And those are great goals. I don't just miss those. God knows my husband and I moved the hell out into the farm. Not wor we weren't worried about feeding the goddamn world. I mean, 160 acres of pinto beans isn't going to feed that many people. Um, but we felt it was a crop that was, it was an honest crop. It could be sold. It was a food crop, you know, and we, we, we really, that's what we wanted to do. The rest of our stuff was, we made, we made a living by growing enough stuff to sell and incorporating the price for us into it so that we could have all the pork and lamb and cream and butter and eggs and cheese and all the stuff and veggies that we wanted essentially free if you don't count the labor but of course we were on the farm so we didn't care about the labor you see i mean there's there's that trade-off now we're kind of in a whole other Thing. Anyway, I'm going to get back to where I started was I started talking about food and I started talking about food in these ways. And ultimately, at Monticello, they began to, in the early 90s, have a uh, series of four events every summer uh, called Plantation Weekend. And I was a presenter on Mulberry Row. And what I wanted to talk about and had an opportunity to talk about was all the people that grew the food there and especially the food of the enslaved community and what we know about that, that food and what we can uh, uh, build from that and the personalities and because there's all this paper and and notations and records and history with monticello it makes it very exciting to be able to 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 be in that venue because you're not just talking about nameless lists. You really have real, you know, Peter and Edie, and, and I could talk about real people doing real things, and I'll give you an example. In 1776, Thomas Jefferson's wife wrote in January on the 19th, while he was off doing something crazy political, she was home, pregnant again, and she kept notes because she was the how her job was the housekeeper to make sure that everything that came in and everything that went out um but that it were balanced but also that there was enough of everything because she was in charge of you know more than 100 people and she wrote killed 15 hogs made 200 pounds soft soap 220 pounds hard soap put up 32 firkins of lard now that's a stupendous amount of food and most of the time in uh kind of the previous um historical uh ways of looking at plantations and farms and the work of man, uh, white men white women and black people those parts of the facts have gotten just occluded and why because most of the people that teach don't know how to do any of this stuff so they don't know how to open it up and explain it so in my work what i was trying to do was explain if you had i don't know if any of y'all have ever been to a pig killing you know so you, i don't know if you know but when you got 100 you know a, a, a 250 300 pound pig you got a lot of stuff to deal with and 15 of them is a whole lot of stuff and so that's going to be several days of work it means that the black people who were in charge of doing all these things had to know how to do it they'd been part of it every year since they were children they knew how to make lard they knew how to butcher the hog they knew how to do the bleeding they knew how to make the sausage they knew how to make the sauce they knew how to put the, the hams in the in the salt i mean they had the whole thing 
That's how they, that's, they knew that. Then you had all the people that supplied all the firewood for all those kettles and all the people that hauled all the water. Okay, and, and you know, all of the stuff that had to go into Mar Martha Wells Jefferson being able to write those seemingly simple lines. Okay, so we, I, I thank her that she wrote them because many housewives didn't write that kind of detail and she was very detailed. But because it allows me to open out and look at the work of the people who did it. So that's always been a, a, a deep fascination for me when I talk to audiences. So I worked there doing that for six summers, went off to graduate school, um, long and complicated life, just because, you know, it's a long, complicated life. Uh, and the, um, uh, when I got my, uh, uh, when I finished my doctorate, part of what I was, just before I finished my doctorate, I was working in Detroit at the Charles Wright Museum of African American History and Culture with Christy Coleman, who has been, as you may know, the CEO at the Civil Rights Museum. I had worked for her at Colonial Williamsburg. Anyway, she is a, a profoundly intelligent and brilliant person. And working for her was always a, a great learning experience and she invited me out uh, to come and help her and her staff uh, as the uh, African-American research historian for a 24,000 square foot exhibit which was finally opened in 2004. So I was there for 18 months and that was my last city that I lived in and it was a hell of an experience I gotta tell you. Um, and when I finished, I came home uh, and finished my dissertation and made the shift. Of, was, um, I applied for the job that was open and was accepted at Monticello. So in 2006, I went there. My goal, if I had, as I was asked, you know, many of you probably had the experience of being interviewed by various people to have jobs. And they ask you, well, what would you like to do while you're here with us? And, Company, blah blah blah, and I said, "Well, you know, for me, uh, that sign that's outside the kitchen door that says the food was carried, the food was carried, you know, one of those really passive aggressive kind of statements. The food was carried, you know, without even naming who or how or what or any of those things." I said, "I want that sign down," and I know that Monticello is working toward developing this kitchen and its exhibitry such that that sign can come down and I want to be part of that and I was able to be part of that and so I had um I worked with curatorial and and, and others to be just on various teams as we developed uh the reader rail that's in there now and the storylines and the conservation and the um uh, uh you know, and then I got to light in 2009 when uh, Walter Stabe, Chef Walter Stabe, who did Taste of History, if you've ever uh, seen that show, uh, look it up, Netflix, and um, probably even on YouTube, maybe, a uh, whole series he did. Well, he has been cooking in historic kitchens, and he is the chef at the um, uh, um, the, the big uh, rest, the original restaurant in Pennsylvania where George Washington and all those people all went when they were there convening for the um, uh, for the convention. Anyway, he was got, uh, you know, doing this really very uh, high, uh, high profile and uh, very professional series, television series. And he came down to Monticello and what was interesting was that he kind of expected that we were already using our kitchen. It had been restored by this time, restored to its 189 uh, ability. And I knew a great deal about the people who worked there and what they were doing. And I was invited to be, um, uh, to work with him in the kitchen. And so in 2009, I actually got to light the first fire in the kitchen. Um, it hadn't been done that way before. And, um, so we cooked and uh, he won uh, three Emmys uh, for that series, which was really lovely to be part of. Anyway, all of, 
during all of that, I more and more began to use the elite kitchen as a focus because we had these incredible stories. We had, of course, James Hemmings. We had Peter Hemmings. We had Edith uh, Hearn Fawcett. We had Francis um, uh, uh, Hearn. And um, we, these were people that I could know a good deal about and I knew about their training and I knew quite a bit about the food they cooked. And so for the first time, uh, uh, many, many people, uh, the James Hemming Society and others, have begun to really discuss historic African American chefs in their capacity as chefs, as skilled chefs. What did they have to know? How did they learn how to do it? What was the presentation style? What were the what did the, the, the white diners expect and then what did they get and all of that stuff. Anyway, so that, that's been largely my, um, uh, my, work, my work there. And then when I left Monticello to come home, uh, partly because I was getting old, you know, I, 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 I said, God, I'm gonna be 70 years old and I really would like to spend some time with my husband for a while, you know, before, you know, before we both cack. And, uh, the, um, uh, but I needed to, of course, bring in an income. And so I began really doing classes, uh, cooking, canning classes, baking classes, cookery classes in general, um, writing more about those kinds of processes and beginning to develop what I've come to call home provisioning, which is my shorthand for um, how do we, uh, how, to, how to have what you need when you need it, which is the definition of home provisioning. How to have what you need when you need it. I, you know, I can't hear you because for some reason you're... Mute. I was on mute. Voices. And I actually... Oh, I, oh, I, 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 I would love to hear I your mute. voice. I, I love to hear you laugh, so you can just laugh whenever you <laughs> bother me at all. Yeah, no, you, I mean, I love that. Uh, how to have what you need when you need it is just, I mean, I'm reminded of like, like people jarring and having pantries of uh, uh, peppers that they put up. Put up, peaches that they put up, put up you know, uh, all types of veggies that they could not eat at that time. But they put it inside of some sort of a brine and some sort of a you know sealed they, container they put, they put, yeah. and put it up. And they stored and it. it. Yeah, and all levels of people have done it because you know the idea refrigeration and ice and all of that stuff is really damn new. You know, it's a hundred and that's a hundred years old. We're a hundred right. to 1920. So it's, right. yeah, maybe, you know, 120 years old. And so canning it, as we think of it now with glass jars, glass jars, tempered glass jars weren't invented until um, 1885. So canning as we know it is not a really ancient craft, um, but it is a fun thing to do. And it's wonderful. And we now have, the technology to really do it well. We have wonderful containers. We've got great lids. Right. We have right. almost everybody right. has running water. Mm -hmm. We all have mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, access to uh, orchards or wherever we're going to go. You know, we have we have access that the first women to do these things, and I'm talking about in the 1880s and 90s and then the early teens of the, night of the 20th century, were the most prosperous women. These mm -hmm. were prosperous farm women mm -hmm. who had access to wells and spring houses and cool cellars and all of the things that you have to have, and especially water and firewood, okay? So these were not crafts for very poor people, really poor people used a, a, um, a different um, sear, a different uh, range of food preservation. They used salt, they used drying. And I do have to tell you that regardless of all of the, the deep uh, sentiment, sentimentalizing about all of our ancient ancestors and all that bullshit, 
Um, <laughs> they they left, They ate very very boring year round boring 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 meals that consisted often of meat meal molasses if they were poor whites and meat meal molasses and maybe a little bit of garden truck maybe if they were black but if they were sharecroppers white or black they almost always never had gardens they were not allowed to have gardens they had to have their sharecroppers they had to grow crop up to the, to the walls of their cabin so we have this real disparity in terms of also our idealization of what farmers were like and what farming was like those were there were some places that that meet that idealization but they are largely um, uh, lower middle and upper and um, uh, uh, status people and almost always further west in the northwest um, and uh, people who own their land because if you owned your land then you could grow any goddamn thing you wanted on your land but if you were a tenant farmer if you were a sharecropper you had very very severe limitations on what you could grow so these are also parts of that political scene which like i said when i first met you uh while i was tying in the political of the past i i was seeing you tie in the political of the present so that was them. Um, so now, you know, um, I have been lecturing broadly. In fact, the last time I saw uh, Jerome was a lecture that I gave uh, at the uh, medical school yeah, library, the, uh, right? Yeah, in, uh, in, in, uh, College of Virginia, uh, BCU. College of Virginia BCU. Yes, thank you. And um, that was a, a, a very enjoyable uh, lecture. I love the people who came were very interested and asked great questions. And so people are interested in the past. I would like to help people understand how to get kind of past the kind of the 200 year old dead people and bring it up to why do we care now? What, what does it mean for us now? What can we uh, take from it that's valuable? And what can we shop that's not valuable? There are many things about the past that are not valuable. Uh, tuberculosis, diphtheria, no vaccines, um, you know, outhouses, you know, no toilet paper, no paper towels, um, you know, diarrhea, and all that. Yeah, awful, awful. Yeah, yeah. That are, those are not glamorous things. Those are not, they weren't fun then and they're not fun now. And at the time, the vast number of people um, knew that all everybody knew somebody that had died and everybody probably had uh, a, a sibling that died my mother-in-law who was born in um, um, 1905 her younger sister picked a thing on her face when she was 14 and died of blood poisoning this is in South Dakota folks white folks wow. you know I mean I'm talking you know Sweden Norwegian Dane white folks on a farm that owned property because mm. there were any antibiotics right. uh, all of the medical, medicine, herbal, all of that was all palliative. It was all palliative. It helped you sometimes feel better while you died or feel better while you got better. But nobody, they didn't make, it didn't make you better because there wasn't anything that could cure smallpox, cholera, diphtheria, bookworm, tuberculosis, yaws, None of it, none of it. So I think sometimes I'm gonna make a statement that, you know, some people have dumped my ass over, but this is where I'm at about it. <laughs> the whole idea that somehow we're now going to return to some era of, of um, medical herbology is absolute and complete bullshit. It doesn't, it has no meaning. Anything, so you drink some mint tea, fine. It tastes like mint and it's nice and it's pleasant, but it doesn't cure anything. It doesn't, the things we have now. And so we have to really be realistic about what, you know, the world we live in, um, uh, in terms of food and medicine and health and all that stuff. I see your face there. <laughs> Who are you?
okay? I can't hear your voice though. Katie, sorry. Katie. Oh, Kate. Okay, Kate. I see you there on the list. I should probably get your your microphone on. I had I There's had muted myself. I had muted myself. Oh, oh, okay, okay. So you have to unmute it. All right. So All did right. Uh, he moved away and you came in? So I wondered if you had a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do want to. I, I, I do want to line of thought. I appreciate that line of thought about how you know people like to hyper sensualize this idea of this idea of alternative, no, remedies, alternative remedies, home remedies. Home remedies. Early in my early in work, my is, you like know work, people know a lot you know, about work that I've done the work that I've done today we focus on holistic health and stuff like that. Like that. But yeah. our early conversations, so our early like conversations for, like those I, for, for those that are not aware, for those that are not aware, I have I've I have I've I've been, I've, been, I've been shot before, right? So I have I have bullet fragment in my knee. I had a bullet go through. I had a bullet go through my lower my lower tibula. And I got a bullet fragment. I got a bullet fragment in my wrist. I'll tell you the story how it I'll happened. I'll tell you the story how it happened at another time. At another time. But, but I was not going home I was not to like going take herbal remedies to like take to herbal remedies to treat my gunshot wounds. <laughs> I went straight to the triage. I went straight to the triage. <laughs> I got that shit taken care of. You guys, you know what I mean? Anesthesia, they did surgery. They did surgery. You know, I went home you know, and I, I went you know, home, took my pain medications, you know, get my medication, you know, because I couldn't walk. Because I, you know, I couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, when I entered into this work around, around like natural around, healing and natural, like natural medicine, medicine, there's a very clear, like there's some very things clear, that you need to go to the doctor that you for, need to go to the doctor for, and there's some things that you might be able to handle on your own, you know, you do your detox, you know, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do, there's like trauma care, Trauma care. I need to get some shit handled by a specialist. Handled by a specialist. And some like, yeah, man, maybe there's some like, yeah, yeah man, maybe drink some ginger tumor. Maybe drink some ginger tumor. <laughs> yes, and you, because you're gonna get better anyway, but it's gonna help. It's gonna make you whether it's a placebo or not. Right. And I and I, right. I will take it to another. Um, add a, a personal example. I've had four children. Uh, uh, two in the hospital. Uh, the first one was what I call slash and burn obstetrics of the early 60s. Uh, pretty gruesome. Uh, although I knew a good deal about childbirth just because I happened to be a person that knew some people or whatever, you know, I'd done some reading. But that didn't in any way stand me in good stead when they decided to do an episiotomy and all that other shit. Okay. Um, I then had nine years later another baby in the hospital and this time um it was with uh, doctors who understood the newer ideas of lamaze and mm -hmm. uh non-medicated mm -hmm. birth and but you know still in the hospital but you know we we uh it took about two and a half hours and uh, you know we went right along and um uh i was uh, my my husband at the time and i were right pleased that uh we were there partly because the doctor said, oh, well, this has gone so fast. We've got some time. Would you like to have the baby circumcised while you're right here? Well, my husband was Jewish and he wanted to have the baby circumcised and that was fine by me. And so there with both of us holding the baby, he was circumcised. And then two days, you know, a, a day later or so I went home. But I do have to tell you a great story. So I go down to my, I'm taken down to my room and I'm rooming in with the baby, of course, which is fabulous. And uh, the uh, the nurse who's in charge of my room comes in. Um, uh, just the most, do you know how there's some black women who have, they look like they have just finished praying <laughs> for you? <laughs> Why did I, I see a picture of a woman in my mind. A woman in my mind. Just beautiful, smooth skin and just the most, gracious smile because she knew she needed to pray for me and uh i was fine and letting her do that that was just really great and um and you know but she said and we got to talking her name was mrs blue 
And she was the first person, this is in 69, she was the first person I met who uh, was a Vietnam War widow. Mm. And so I had a, you know, uh, again, you know, I was really part of the anti-war movement and, mm. you know, it was a real lefty mm. radical folk singer at the time. But her, mm. her sacrifice was immediate and evident to me and I certainly would not have been in the slightest bit uh, disparaging of it. But she was wonderful and she was from the South, which, you know, if you live in Southern California long enough, you meet everybody from everywhere, but uh, Southern accents always just kind of always have interested me because I, I do have Southern roots, even though I was not raised in the South. Right. And she said, right. uh, when she came in, she said, well, I hear you did that La Mans. And that everything just went really well. And I said, <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah. How'd you hear about it? She said, well, there's a lot of these girls doing that La Mans and it's really nice. I like handling them when they come out because they're really, they're really calm. Anyway, I was <laughs> breaking up. I mean, I was falling the fuck out. And very genteel because she never knew that I was laughing at her. But I'll tell you, I've been calling it La Mans ever Man. since. <laughs> La Mans. You know, that La Mans method? My God, squirts them babies right the hell out. Lord of anyway. Mercy. Well, uh, okay, then uh, uh, years later, um, I had, so I had one in 60, one in 69. Then I had my daughter in 78 and <clears throat> my uh, youngest son in 80. And I had them both at home um, in South Dakota with um, one was a midwife and one kind of was out. She couldn't get there. She was 50 miles away. So there we were. But I felt by this time I had been a, um, a La Leche League leader. I had um, read a great deal about birthing um, and felt very capable. I mean, I had two very straightforward deliveries, so I certainly didn't feel like I had to think about or worry about. And of course, I was an old babe on a lot of levels. You know, I had, uh, by this time, I was 36 and 30, and 38. Um, <clears throat> But I was very healthy and all that stuff. And um, I had, so I had two babies at home um, in South Dakota. So I've had this breadth of what I call thinking about women, thinking about families, thinking about women who had, you know, eight or 10 children and then lost five or six or seven of them to disease. So when people talk to me about anti-vax, I actually want to beat the hell out of them. Because I've seen the newspaper report of the guy in the, in the San Andoa Valley uh, during the diphtheria outbreak uh, of 19, of, excuse me, of uh, 1814, who lost all seven of his children to diphtheria. Every fucking one. And that's a tragedy that none of us in this first world country has ever had to endure. You know, re, uh, in, a re, in recent Western times, we just don't. And yet there's still people in the world who still suffer that kind of stuff because of lack of healthcare. So these are issues that are trenchant to me. They are, um, they are not trivial, even if I sometimes make you know, vulgar jokes about them. It's mostly just to get the hell through. Because otherwise you just cry all day and I don't have time to do that. So that's kind of uh, that. Uh, so look, let's uh, uh look, let's uh let's 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 let's, 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 let's hear back a little bit. Around. Okay. Around. Um um we're, we're talking about food. we're talking about fees. Age. We're talking about mm -hmm. we're talking home about visioning. home visioning. We're talking about we're talking about food. access and justice access and, things, and, like justice and things, like things like that. One of the things that has been super, super important for me is to like point out to like person, point out personas, personas, people, people right, that right, are that are uh, uh, historical uh, examples. Historical of, examples uh, of uh, I don't know excellence. I don't know, excellence. Uh, uh, professional, uh, uh, professional, uh, professional, 
ability, ability, whatever. Ability, and, um, whatever. I know you do and, a lot of talks on Mary Vino. Mm -hmm. well, I don't know she, if everybody knows, know who that everybody is. knows who that is. Mary Randolph was a um, very upper class elite woman who was the sister-in-law of Thomas Jefferson's elder daughter. So she was in that, you know, elite class. But she was a house a housewoman, um, and at the time, that women of that class were expected to learn how to run a household. Many of them, of course, did a very dulcetary job and didn't give a damn and really didn't like it, and so they would have uh, housekeepers or whatever. Others, like Mary, appear to have really uh, been interested. Now, I have absolutely no idea, no data of how she dealt with the enslaved people that worked in her kitchens, and that's who worked in her kitchens. But I got to tell you, she wrote recipes that are very clear and give us a very clear idea of what those cooks knew how to do and what she expected them to know how to do. And she was very well known for the food served at her table. She was called Queen Molly in Richmond. Mm. So mm. out of that, I use a lot of that kind of information of how to then tease out. If you're gonna make um, souse, if you're gonna have, you know, using parts of the pig. Well, maybe then you have to know what the hell the parts of the pig are, and you have to um, uh, have the proper tools to do it, and uh, all, all the things that many, many people had. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna make hominy, um, there's a difference between pounded hominy, which is just corn that's been dehulled by pounding and then sifting to get the hulls off, mm -hmm. and that makes uh, essentially a cornmeal like a cornmeal mush, mm. or mm. hominy grits, which, uh, uh, and again, the names are just often redundant and they're very confusing, where you're gonna treat the corn to get the hull off with ash lye, which Africans, when they came to the New World, were brought to the New World, as English, who, when they came to the New World, learned from the native people. Mm. That process mm. of Nixtamalization is mm -hmm. the, the formal mm -hmm. name for that. And with that, you have a, a corn, it's been dehulled, and it is today, we often uh, uh, use the Mexican word for is pozole, okay? So the bi our big hominy, you'll sometimes see a can of white, it looks like popcorn, only it's okay, big hominy. It's been ash, ash lye processed. Why it's valuable, and was valuable and still is valuable, is that when the corn has been processed that way, it changes the B vitamins such that the corn, that the niacin that's in the corn can be utilized by the human body, which is how whole cultures that really basically ate corn and beans and some vegetables, you know, among the poor and the slaves and everybody in the Aztec world, you know, they didn't eat a lot of fancy stuff, how they could eat that for thousands of years and not get pellagra. Mm. Because in the 19th century, as commercial dehulling, in order to get the germ out of the corn so that it could be stored for longer and shipped further, because we now had a country that was vast, mm -hmm. of which corn was, you know, cornmeal and all products, uh, we begin to have this terrible outbreak of pellagra, uh, and it's among the poor, and it's among people who are eating just cornmeal, um, um, uh, side pork, and which is which is very salty and fatty. Which the fat doesn't. They needed the protein from the fat, but they just didn't have enough of it to be perfectly frank, and they didn't get enough lean meat protein to go with it. Mm. And molasses. That's that's what's called the three M's. It's called, and Pellegra became a real plague in this country, killed thousands and thousands of people up through the 1920s and into the 30s when they discovered that it was uh, the lack of B vitamins that, created, that caused it. So we had people in parts of Africa and we had people in Italy who had been uh, uh, given, turned on to, sh shown how you know, they grew corn or they were sent corn and it was of a dehulled cheaper industrial produced variety because by that time it was being shipped by great shiploads you know all over and we begin to see pellagra in those societies mm. pellagra was never known before that 
It certainly was not known in any Mesoamerican societies. And ash lye production was being used by 200 BCE. It was being used by about 57, that's the last figure that I looked at, about 57 different Native American cultures over and above the Aztecs. Wow. Wow. So, the, so, so, the, so, the, so the ash line so method, the, the of, method of, of, of treating the corn, treating the corn was, an indigenous was an indigenous method that, method that allowed that for, allowed for food had food health primary food food had a primary sustenance. Yes. So when you had poor people in the South prior to the industrial, the industrial production of cornmeal, Poor white people, poor black people, they were often ash live producing their corn because it was it's easier to dehull it. You know how the hull, when you eat popcorn, you get that mm. hull stuck, yeah. that thing, that yeah. that that hard part. Mm. Well, that gets rid of that. And then that that uh posole, that hominy, big hominy, is uh delicious in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And it uh, gives you those extra, it allows your body to use the, the vitamins that are already in the corn in a way that it, without it you can't. Mm -hmm. So people among Southerners, white and black, they would fry their hominy often. So they got the fried hominy, they'd use pork lard, so they had the, 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 the fat which they needed in order to utilize vitamin D. You have to ha eat fats. And for people who were working outside, uh, they needed those fats and they needed the calories from the fats because people in the 19, early 19th century, poor whites and poor blacks, probably went, ran through about 3,000 calories a day just in labor, just doing the labor that they wow. did. Wow. So they needed this, uh, <clears throat> uh, this valuable food stuff. And so you can easily see that as uh, sharecropping and tenant farming and the general store and and uh, masters and then bosses supplying the cheapest foods they could to tenants and and sharecroppers they now are shifted to this diet of just of this denatured cornmeal so tell me so tell me, so this is fascinating to me because that's that's something that I never knew that 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 that, that the, the the difference between uh, uh, hominy and hominy grits, and then uh, the whole piece around the. Uh, the and let uh, me just add parenthetically, the pozole is the same material. Is the same that when you then grind it, it makes the masa for tortillas, and for tamales. Okay, so that flavor, picture that flavor profile. Right, when you grind that up and make a mash, it's sticky. Okay. Regular cornmeal, if you just use regular cornmeal and you go like this, like it won't make a it won't tortilla. Stay, it won't stay together, yeah. But when it's been nixtamalized, mm. it will do that. That's what gives it that sticky, sticky thing. And if you ate big hominy, fried with scrambled eggs, it'll just knock you the hell out. Um, <laughs> you still have that sticky, you know, if you put it in a stew, if you make pozole, which is a, a stew in southwestern, uh, uh, United States and in Mexico, where it's meat and chilies and stuff. Okay. Anyway, so that those are parts of older folk culture food ways that are uh, that are important to re. I think to 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 review mm. for many people who you know it saddens me that American black people and poor white people have been so. Uh, um, betrayed by the idea of pork being a bad thing. It's just, it just not. It's just, that's just bullshit. It's, it's actually how was the animal raised and what kind of traditions. If we're looking at something that's 3,000 years ago in the hot, dry desert mm. of wherever, mm. you know, mm. hey, I don't know, it's conceivable it makes some sense, but on another level, why are we still 2,000 year, years later still you know, buying into that when you have this incredibly protein-rich, fat-valuable animal that's easy to raise on small, you know, in small settings, um, and first of all, is really good. Uh, I mean, I've raised enough pigs and butchered enough pigs, and I eat pork a lot, and I use lard. Um, I use butter. I don't use any, you know, I use canola oil, I use olive oil, but I don't, you know, it's 
we, we have to be really careful not to get sucked into food regimes that betray class and status, class status instead of real nutrition. And so that a question has that up. There's a question that popped up that in, to, in, uh, in the chat that speaks specifically to that idea, uh, or at least kind of like allows us to open up this, this pathway, because I'm really excited about this part of the conversation. Um, uh, she, she, uh, Kenyatta asks, you were speaking about B vitamins. I heard that eating only vegetables won't provide B12, which is essential, but there had to be a time in history that people only had vegetables and they lived without issues, right? No, there's never been a time that people have only lived on vegetables. We come from, we've always been omnivores. We have eaten an enormous range of kinds of foods. We've certainly eaten lots of kinds of vegetables, but from all of the anthropology that I've read, um, and I've tried to read as deeply as, as possible, uh, all groups have um, used and eaten meat uh, when they had it and when they could find it. And when they did eat it, they tried to eat the fattiest parts of it. They ate the brains, they ate the kidneys, they ate the, they ate the livers, they ate the, um, the jowl, uh, they ate um, uh, many times in certain um, uh, northern uh, uh, Alaskan or, or uh, tribal groups of those sorts, many times the really leanest meat out of a, they just fed that to the dogs because it didn't have any fat in it. You have to have fat in your diet. That's why when we find uh, archaeological digs of, of, uh, that show various cultures living in various places, uh, you know, in the old world, fat many thousands of years ago, um, you know, 40, 50, 60,000 years ago, we find these bones broken so the marrow could come out because that's the other really major source of fat from very large ungulates. And so people were always killing animals. If you're going to look back and think, uh, oh, well, you know, I mean, goddamn bonobos kill animals, kill other monkeys and eat them. And, and chimpanzees kill other monkeys and eat them. Um, Primates are omnivores. We're all omnivores, which means we can eat a wide range of things. And there's never been a time that anybody has ever just subsisted on vegetables. When they had to uh, subsist on, say, vegetables and a grain, they were almost always malnourished and often very dissatisfied with the situation. And we see it. Yeah. Yes, many of our ancestors who got shoved in these goddamn ships and brought over had to subsist for periods of time on just you know yeah uh yams and, <laughs> and, and, and yeah and a, a just horrible block all in one pot of of uh you know whatever but the minute they got to brazil or carousel or uh you know or south carolina and had access to any other kinds of foodstuffs they immediately began to um, uh, exploit them in South Carolina. They immediately, because they were people who were estuarial, they only brought people who knew how to grow rice to South mm -hmm. Carolina. Why the hell would you not, you know, right? So these people already came from uh, estuarial areas uh, in Western Africa that knew how to grow rice. That means they've been out on those um, uh, marshes and they knew how to get clams and fish and turtles and shrimps. yeah, they ate all that stuff and, and yeah and shrimp. They were they, yeah. and so when we see the cuisine of a place like Charleston, you know, and we see that stuff was all in the market. Where the hell did it come from? Well, it came from almost always black fishermen uh, out in those marshes who knew how to how to do that um, and who who ate that. The first uh, cowboys in this culture, in West in American culture, were men largely from nomadic and um, herder tribes people from the Sahel who knew cows. They knew how to herd cows, how to mate cows, how to call cows, how to pull uh, uh, pull calves, how to you know, all the shit that, that, that it takes to take care of cows. You know what I mean? And and they also knew how to ride horses because that's how you're going to have to do it. And they ate meat because that was what they had. The um, 
the guys in uh, the gaucho in in uh, Argentina, in uh, Argentina or uh, Paraguay, and, you know, they they eat meat. The Tatars of uh, northern Siberia, they ate meat. The Laps, they eat reindeer. All of us have, had, in one way or another, often uh, um, seek meat as part of our diet. And I've got to tell you, and I, I you know. Maybe just because I'm old and I'm mean, and I'm just going to tell you. I just don't think that uh, uh, all the diets that I see out there that do not include animal protein, mostly they're just not interesting. They're just not that goddamn interesting. And I have to tell you that a lot of times when I the food prepared by the people who are in that trip, the food ain't all that goddamn interesting either. It's innovative maybe because you know how to put a, something with a something else on a plate the same plate in that marvelous but other than that it isn't something that can sustain sustain you you're not going to eat that and go out and plow you're not going to eat that and grow go out and chop enough wood um to make a charcoal pit or, or just even on a present day basis you're not gonna go out there and garden for four and a half hours on, on because you that's something you go and you pay $29 for a fun little experience with somebody. But other than that, it's not food. It's just like, I don't, anyway. So, that's, uh, that's so I'm going to throw this in there, know, right? So what's fascinating, mm -hmm. what's fascinating right. is that uh, when you brought up the indigenous community, right? Uh, you know, I've been reading the indigenous history of the United States. And uh, when they get to the part where they start talking about how they hunted down the buffalo to take away the indigenous uh, people's uh, food source, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's riveting, right? Because when you look at like the hills of like all these buffalo skulls and stuff like that, like this is a very deliberate act. Oh no, it was an absolute yes. So when we see, yeah, when we see those kinds of things we got to assume that that means something that they have truly deprived people of a valued substance so then if we now move away from the actual event of the of the deprivation and the ugliness of all that we we'll look and say okay well what was everybody doing with all those damn buffalo well they were eating them and they were eating particular parts of them more than others and they had preferences and I don't know about all y'all, but a buffalo is a very big animal, and there was never only one person gonna kill a buffalo and skin it and gut it and do all that by themselves ever. Mm. And Native Americans also all must have participated in many cases over the the, the countless eons that they were here in um, you know the wastage of a lot of food because if you run 15 buffaloes over a cliff. In order to catch them, because all right. you've got is an arrow, right? You know, well, you, you're not going to be able to retrieve all of that meat. That's right. a lot of damn right. meat, yeah, okay? Right. And so you're going to maybe get the top ones, mm. and the others have all been squashed. And within it's a hot South Dakota day. Let's say I haven't lived in South Dakota. Um, you know, it's 90, and uh, by two days later, you got you got to get the hell away from there because you got you know, 11 buffalo at the bottom of a cliff rotting. Right. And you only got to save three. Hopefully, if there were nine men and maybe three or four or five women to help skin and carry the ones that they had. I mean, this butchering thing is not, it's not just some easy thing to so do. I, so I got this thought, right? So, so I was talking to somebody. Brother uh, James Brother, Smith, who uh, worked with Malcolm. Malcolm. And we were just chatting and, we talking, just about chatting and talking about rural life, right? And um, the, the conversation got to like how we ate before we moved into the inner city, right? And so he challenged me with this thought, this question. He was like, do you think that people ate beef and steak every day of the week? And if so, how could they possibly have afforded that, right? Considering that you might have had a cow, if you own some land, right? 
that that you wanted to keep that cow alive for milk and et cetera, but you probably yeah. had some chickens, you know what I'm saying? But and a pig. And a pig. But at the at, but in, but in the in the greater context, like you weren't slaughtering your cow and your pig every week for bacon and steaks. No. no, 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 no. You were you were okay. So you have a pigs were a, a little smaller back in the nineteenth century. So you butchered this pig, and um, uh, it's a um, you're going to get about two thirds out of a pig uh, out of their of their standing weight. Excuse me. And uh, you're going to have to have some salt, remember, you know, because there's always a thing you've got to have to do all this stuff. So let's assume you got some salt and you got your, uh, uh, some kind of a barrel. So you're going to put that all, all the meat that you can away in the coldest weather when you're going to butcher this animal. So what are you going to eat? Well, what's really incredible, and I've followed the documentation because I think it's so interesting, is... You're going to eat all the offal first, because that's the part that's going to spoil first. The mm. offals are, of course, the brains, the liver, the kidney, the pancreas, the plot, the tripe, you know, the, all of that. The, what we have come to call the guts, okay, mm. but was always considered, um, and the word was used widely through the 18th, 19th century, across all levels of societies, it was called offals. And everybody knew what the hell it was. And from the offals could be prepared uh, souse, um, uh, um, scrapple, uh, blood sausage. All those things could all be prepared from that. You know, when you butchered the animal, you hung it as best you could, or you rolled it best you could so somebody could hold a basin underneath where you cut its throat to get the blood. You're mm. gonna, not going to waste that. You keep stirring it so it doesn't coagulate. You're going to add some vinegar. You're going to add some rice. Talk about boudin, anyone, right? <laughs> you're going to add. Um, you're going to um, uh, make the sauce, which is a, a lot of little bits, and vinegar, and it kind of really coagulates, and you put it in a container, and then you cut it in pieces, and you can fry it or whatever, or you're going to make scrapple, which is when you're going to mix it with cornmeal, all those little bits and pieces, and cook it with cornmeal. And you know how uh, cornmeal gets kind of gelatinous, and then you can cut it and fry it. Okay, so for for a, for a, a week or two or three, at each butchering time, on any farm, everybody gets to eat the offals. Mm. It's this big protein rush, usually right in the middle of the winter. It's quite nice to have. Nice, mm. sharp flavors. Mm. Uh, very uh, mouth feels very satisfying. Uh, uh, very uh, lot, very high calorie. Okay. okay. The rest of it's all in salt. And you're going to slowly budget that out because it's got to last you till the next pig. Mm. Now, your chickens, you're mostly keeping them for eggs. And then when you finally get a hen that just, you know, she's finally just a goddamn old, you know, you know that she's never going to lay another egg. Mm -hmm. you, you butcher her and put her in the pot and you just hope that the preacher doesn't find out about it and decide to come to Sunday dinner. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the great tropes in African-American literature, you know, um, of the preacher coming and always eating the, you know, that hen. <laughs> are going to have, you know, they're going to lay, they're going to lay on some eggs. Um, they need usually anywhere between 13 and 21. Mm. And they're going to sit for 21 days. And then you're going to have some chicks. And you're going to mm. then decide what you're going to do with those chicks. Well, if they're, they grow to six to eight, 10 weeks old, uh, they're fryers. And you, what you're going to do if you're poor, you're going to sell them mm. into the economy Mm. for money because you still have to pay taxes you still have to buy salt you still have to maybe buy another axe your wife really would like to have a ribbon um you, you know what i'm saying you got you got things you need to have so yeah. those 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 chickens those fryers are going to be used as part of your economy right. and right. you're not going to eat any of your birds but you're going to have eggs and that's mm. that's a lovely mm. thing to be able to have and mm. it's good good protein for you mm. to have and depending on how many chickens you have you know you could have uh, your 
uh, if you had a cow, you know, that's a big if. Who, that's a big if. Yeah, this is a big if. <laughs> you got the if, and it really does depend regionally and over time and a whole other thing. Now, during slavery, probably no black people had cows, but um, at once, you know, we're past 1865, numbers of people have, you know, whatever. Right. And they're, so, that, so they got a cow, so they've got some milk. Now, if they're lactose intolerant, the milk isn't as useful to them straight, mm. fresh milk, but they can usually tolerate clabber, which is what we call yogurt today. Mm. So it's inoculated by being soured. And so we really have soured milk and really have a lot of elder, elder black people in the late 19th century, late 18th century, 19th century, who uh, can remember eating clabber, mm. which was soured mm. milk. And, be, and because the soured milk allowed them to digest it. Mm. Okay. It, it, you know, so there was, and you hoped, you kind of hoped, you had to bring your cow to the bull once a year because she's got to be fresh. Mm. She has to have come mm. fresh once a year for you to milk her, right? right. And right. you're going right. to get a calf right. out of her. And depending on your, you know, what your needs are, you either want another half a calf, so maybe you could have two cows, right. or you could sell a half or calf, mm. okay? Or you want a bull calf because then you can raise, you can you can castrate him, mm. sell and raise him as a steer, and then sell him for more money. So this they were always talking, well, how how are farms making these little bits of of income that they need to have um, to send? You know, it, it cost Mary McLeod Bethune's family something like a twenty five cents a week to send her to school. Mm. This poor weak child couldn't work in the cotton field. So all of her nine brothers and sisters and her parents busted their ass out the cotton field to earn this pe these pennies at a time to send her to school. That's how we got Mary McLeod Bethune, because mm -hmm. her family perceived that she was bright, but they also perceived that she couldn't work in the fields. It would kill her. She, was, you know, she was a child. She was too frail. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so they put their energies as a family to making sure that this child got the thing that might save her. They didn't know, of course, that it was going to end up saving a whole lot of folks. Right. I was raised to believe right. that Mary McLeod Bethune raised the sun and Eleanor Roosevelt set the damn thing. So <laughs> that's kind of where I'm coming from. You know? uh, uh, so, you know, so, they, I was, so I asked that question. They're the two greatest women in my in my world when I was a little girl. They were so both I, alive. So, so I asked that question about the, the cows and the chickens and stuff like that, because the challenge was, like, we were talking about having plant-based diets, but not plant-only diets, right? Because it's like, okay, well, if, the, if, if your meat substances were, like, something that you had to stretch, right, mm -hmm. then you had people that were eating lots of, uh, of vegetables, maybe not a wide plethora like we got now when we go to the grocery store, but there's like, a lot. You know, yeah, if you had a plate, yeah. it was like a very small portion of it was the meat. And the well, other part was like, meat the other part was all of that, the salted meat was, was so nice about it was, it has a real high flavor profile. Mm -hmm. And the fat has that really, unctuous mouthfeel mm -hmm. and it doesn't take a whole lot of it sizzling in a pan to flavor, flavor. flavor. a whole to flavor and enrich mm -hmm. a whole lot of something mm -hmm. okay i mean uh uh and that's what when that could be used if you had um so if you had some sweetening and you had some cornmeal so you could make pone and you had a little salt pork and you had vegetables that's that added thing mm -hmm. where you had field peas and collards and turnips and turnip tops and, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, uh, maybe not, you know, where you had to eat the damn, you had to eat it every day, you know, because it's just, the, that's what you had to eat. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You could, you could, if you had enough then in quantity to sustain you, you could do a lot of physical work and still be healthy. Right. It's when 
you have, as you begin to uh, be, find yourself in situations where the landlord or the, the master of the sharecropper won't allow you to have a garden. And so all you can buy is at the store right. and you're already right. in debt. Mm -hmm. So a big treat might be to buy a can of tomatoes. Well, that, you know, for a whole family, for right. you know, on the weekend right. as a as a treat. So those are so when we're really discussing poverty and whether it's black poverty during the sharecropper era, uh, whether it's all those people that were uh, um, um, forced to move out uh, by the Dust Bowl, mm -hmm. all the Okies mm -hmm. as they call it, you know, right. Right. Um, right. Right. they were. They were at the bare edge, not because they were dumb, but because they just they had they didn't have the material culture to do the stuff that many times they knew was there. You know, people aren't stupid. They they still saw magazines. People even occasionally went to the damn movies. You know, when movies first came, everybody had to go do that, and they all saw the various magazines that were for sale. Sometimes they saw it at the landlord's house or. Whatever. They had a sense of the culture. They were not living in jail, you know, mm. cut off mm. from any, you know, and they knew what was good, but they often had no way of participating in what was good. <laughs> sounds like, <laughs> sounds very familiar. Like, oh, very familiar. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. So, you know, the more things change, the more they change, you know, the more they stay the same. You have, um, <laughs> so that, Fascination, which I I applaud on a lot on some levels of people wanting to explore and eat more vegetables. God knows George Washington Carver wrote a lot about sweet potatoes and other vegetables and field peas, uh, but he himself was not really a vegetarian. Uh, he just you know he ate dinner every day at Booker T. Washington's house, you know? right, and right. Booker T. Washington, God knows, was not a vegetarian. Right, right, right. And if you read about the kitchens at, at Tuskegee and the food they produce, and there's been some really great writing fairly recently mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. on, on, the, on the history of those institutions, um, we see that um, no, no, nobody voluntarily in the past would choose a diet that did not include animal protein of some right. sort. Well, you know, I, I, it's just be to be candid and real, man. Like, in a, you, you know, and I both know that there's like a lot of the the, the vegetarian veganism. Like, there's a very privilege. There's a very high element of privilege that goes along with that because it because to be vegan is almost like okay, well, okay, well, you got to be able to get to a grocery store for the most part that's growing the exotic fruits that. Yeah. Usually, people that are read, vegan and vegetarian incorporate into their diet. Have you seen this series on um, what was it called? Um, uh, uh, it was on food fraud of oh. various kinds oh. and food danger. Okay, is the wars in Michoacan over the over the avocados? I may not ever. I may not eat another avocado, knowing that the majority of avocados, eighty-five percent of our avocados come from Michoacan and it's a totalitarian state run by drug lords of which over whom thousands of people have been killed and pushed off their land to sell fucking avocados to the United States. And somebody's gonna talk to me about avocado toast. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> I don't, you know what I'm saying? That's that people gotta understand it's like the whole quinoa thing. Do you realize right. that we jack the price on that so high? in its native culture that the people who grew it and originally ate it couldn't afford to buy it. Wow. And we've wow. done that time. This is our privilege of being in this first world nation and people who are so urban and have no idea where the food comes from. So they, they just never think about it that way. It's like I hardly ever eat chocolate because I want to be absolutely sure before I put that in my mouth, or before I put any money on it, that some child has not been used as slave labor to produce that chocolate. Mm -hmm. I haven't eaten a grapefruit in 25 years mm -hmm. because grapefruit mm -hmm. was one of the big items that were being produced, that were being picked by young hands because they could easily pick them uh, 
I don't want to eat. Yeah. On, so then on top of the whole, when, when it's compounded by the whole eating local, well, you know, I, we don't grow chocolate, coffee, chocolate, vanilla. Uh, you know, and since, pe since uh, so many people don't know how to cook, what the fuck are they going to eat if they can't? You see what I mean? They've been to Starbucks twice a day for 10 years. <laughs> I've, I've been to Starbucks three times in my entire adult life. I got to tell you that. And it was on the road um, on the New Jersey Turnpike because I was driving and I was tired and I needed some coffee. And that's the coffee that they had. But so for me to watch people, and it saddens me to see uh, you, the, that easy acquisition of privilege. Uh, it, it's like a coat that just slips on and it just feels so goddamn good because you go to the Whole Foods and you, you go to the, and you're part of the club that goes to the, and eats the, the it's all just narcissistic, self-gratifying bullshit, you know? It has nothing to do with real food, our farmers, our cooking. It's a, uh, um, and it's it's uh, it's a kind of self-aggrandizement that I find often very offensive, often by people who then go out and carry signs about other things. And I kind of think maybe we should all kind of pull it pull it back in. And that's why home provisioning, having the things you need when you need them, means that however it is you live. Some people live in apartments. Some people live by themselves. Some people have whole families. Some people have, you know, we have all these different ways that we live. But my notion of home provisioning is how to help people think about how they personally live, not how I live, which is an interesting thing, and I'm glad to share it with people, but how they actually live, how to help them actually look at and examine how they actually live and be honest about it. Your kid couldn't possibly eat enough fucking kale to stay alive mm -hmm. on a vegan diet. I've watched too many children 25, 30 years ago when everybody got on the brown rice diet and tried to feed their children, you know, brown rice and apple juice. Well, they didn't have very healthy children. And these were white folks, which was very annoying. But at least I could ignore them. I mean... There's certain people I just don't have to give a shit about, and stupid people are one of them. But anyway, uh, we have to eat, we have to find out, we have to help people um, in a way that wasn't happening in the past when a lot of times people didn't have any choice about what they ate. Okay, now we have many kinds of choices, and we have tools to be introspective about. We have access to history. We can read. We can read and we can, you know. It may be that half of the people that are here totally disagree with anything that I've had to say. That's fine. But go and read at least 15 books before you then come and want to argue with me about it. Because mm. I've read, well, I have a bookshelf, which you can't see here, but it's probably got probably 250 books about food. In one way or another, mm. and I've read all of them. <laughs> so that's kind of how, how I feel about it. You know, you can have whatever opinion you want, but an opinion ain't a fact, and uh, we have um, experience. So, how can we feed ourselves, our immediate family, uh, and next out our neighbor, uh, our, you know, our community? And but we have to start at home, and part of that is learning about what you like to eat, what you prefer, you know, what are the things you'd really prefer to eat. Well, then just eat those things. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't don't worry about all that other stuff. Um, but learn how to make it, because it's going to be cheaper for you to make it. And if it's not exactly cheaper, it's going to be more satisfying. It's going to occupy your mind and your your hands, and uh, it, it's got a whole an ambiance about doing it. That's like making art. Yeah, you know, a lot yeah. of art that's made is really mm -hmm. shitty art. Mm 
<laughs> you wouldn't pay for it, I wouldn't buy it. But the person who made it loved it and loved making it, and that's the big thing. My, what I think of their art is means nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So that that feeling that you make food as a as a creative act, mm -hmm. as a as a part of being a human being, is what this is. And then you can really that liberates you to be thoughtful. Um, and not being too anal about, you know, uh, well, I have to have this or I have to have that. Uh, or I can't cook. Well, I just don't have those ingredients. Well, let's see what you do have. So part of what I'm trying to get to is uh, not only doing um, videos on uh, as part of my subscriber service, but occasionally doing, you know, kind of face-to-face -face consultations with people who can show me this is what's in my pantry. And I can look at it and say, oh, well, if that's what I had, this is what I would make out of it. You know, this is, I see this possibility and that possibility. Because um, we're going to get down to people not having, you know, they're going to have to learn what to do with things that they didn't ordinarily think they would be cooking. Right. Right. Check this. I've got. I've just talked about, about books. One of the questions in the chat. Uh, uh, what's was, your opinion uh, about Michael Pollan? About Michael Pollan. But I was going to ask that question. Their question. Uh, what are some books uh, you, recommend? Books you I've recommend? recommend? I've just got, uh, just got High on the Hall uh, by, by Jessica Harris. By Jessica Harris. Uh, I've been reading that for the last. Probably like the last month. Probably like the last month. Off and on, you know, off and on. Yeah. You know. So, what are some good? What are some good okay, okay, I'll, start, okay. I'll first just dismiss Michael Pollan. I think that he's a man who actually needs to stop writing books for a while. And as it is, um, uh, he and Mark Bittman. Um, I think Mark Michael Pollan was it the he or was it Bittman? No, I think it was Pollan Mike, Mark, who, Mark Bittman, who, Mark Bittman. Who, who moved to California to Napa valley and bought a and bought a little farm so he could do a little farming uh as close to alice waters as he could get um and don't even begin to ask me about alice waters because that's a long story um i think uh of course f food history is always enjoyable there's a fabulous book called i always get the name wrong i'm gonna just run and get the book hold on Okay. Um, it's called uh, In Meat We Trust, mm. Maureen mm. Ogle, mm. and it's a history of the meat industry in the United States from the very beginning. And she's a, a wonderful researcher, very caustic and cynical kind of a woman. I, I've had the pleasure of getting to know her a bit. Uh, the side, uh, the, the subtitle is An Unexpected History of Carnivore America. And it really helps a person get an understanding of uh, the development of industrial and corporate meat production in the United States. Because one of the things that we have as a myth is that somehow there's all these family farms. You know, that we, if we could just get rid of the corporate farms, we'd have all these family farms. And then, no, that's just not, the country's too big, uh, the phenomena's too big. This isn't to say that there aren't improvements that are needed in the dispersal of food, which we are now discovering to our sad effect here. The um, reduction in volume at individual plants when it comes to the uh, butchering and processing of meat, the humane hiring and treatment of the workers, in other words, in, instead of having the line of the animals going past you, at you know 47 miles an hour, you know that maybe we can ramp that production down uh, to really doable limits, so that we maybe make a little less and our stockholders make a little less, but we, uh, you know, we still get meat products anyway. Uh, so it's, there's a lot of things that can be improved, but we really need to understand the history of how it got to where it is before we can really have a sense. Um, 
there's a, a wonderful, wonderful book uh, called In the Shadow of Slavery, Africa's Botanical Legacy in the uh, Atlantic World. As a work of history, it is quite beautifully put together and really helps us get a sense. No, nobody was putting seeds in their hair and coming across on a three month ship field journey in the bottom of a ship uh, in order to import some vegetable. They just weren't. Most of the foodstuffs that are brought with Africans across the Atlantic and into primarily the Caribbean and, and Brazil are brought in the holds of the ships as foodstuffs because the owners knew and had a very good intuition that, they, that the people would only eat the food they were familiar with. Exactly. Because exactly. people who are people who are given food with which they are totally unfamiliar, and especially we'll under situations it. of stress, we'll, well, they die. Yeah. Um, they turn. You know. They. You know. Um, it's just like they understood which Africans were best to bring. You notice they very rarely brought any San Kung Bushmen. Very mm -hmm. only by accident. Okay. Why? Because those were people as hunter gatherer. An, or early um, uh, uh, pastoralists mm -hmm. had uh, had no agricultural tradition, right. so they were not right. valuable to be used that way. Right. And when they were then put into that situation, they didn't have it as part of their cultural kit. They just died. Mm -hmm. They would just turn their faces to the wall and die. Mm -hmm. um, so what did, who, what did you need if you were going to have a population of people who knew how to cut cane, uh, process cane, grow indigo, process indigo, grow sugar, um, I mean, plant, uh, uh, process sugar, uh, uh, do rice. Yeah, the people already knew how to do that. And so they <laughs> brought from cultures who to, uh, knew how to take care of horses. I mean, breeding horses is a complicated thing because horses, along with being the stupidest fucking animal that ever existed on the planet, has to be helped to really produce mm -hmm. in the same way as camels, mm -hmm. by the way, who are, their reproduction thing is very weird. But they had to know cattle, they had to know horses, they had to know how to do those things, or they were useless as enslaved labor, because the white folks didn't know how to do any of that. They mm -hmm. needed those people who knew how to do that, okay? So we, in terms of food in this culture, began to really, uh, over the 16th and 17th century primarily, and in some cases the 15th century in early Brazil. You know, we tend to think, Americans tend to think there were no black people over here until 1619, when actually there were black people here by the end of the 16th century a lot, right? So she covers that and it's beautifully detailed, written and researched and very, she has another book called Black Rice, which is really about rice cultivation in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, it too is uh, really quite wonderful. I mean, so that's just, I mean, just three that I could just throw out there. There's yeah. newer, yeah. newer, some new books on the history of um, the food movements in the early civil rights era. And by that, I mean the 1920s and 30s, uh, the, uh, the ways in which Black Americans uh, accepted, uh, re uh, rejected uh, various aspects of white cultural values about food or, 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 or embraced them or whatever. Uh, there's some good, there's a couple of good books uh, out on that topic. All of this stuff, you know, it's just been slow to write about food because 25 years ago, nobody was writing about food. Except really high upscale, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, not even, it's certainly not an academic, it was not an academic subject, let's put it that way. There were, there were food writers, but they were writing for magazines, which were food magazines, okay? So, but there wasn't a topic in college that you could go and study food studies or food ways 25, 30 years ago. So this, all of this writing, a lot of it's coming out of dissertations and other kinds of wonderful research. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's fairly new. Uh, there's a lot of older um, material 
I have to tell you, I find Rodale and that whole pretentious, you know, organic bullshit to be just that pretentious organic bullshit. Um, <laughs> it's uh, very elitist. I stopped taking the organic growers, the organic magazine. When I one time, you know, I was on a farm and it was, there weren't that many farm magazines, you know, that, that talked about, you know, raising a wide variety of foods. And so I had a subscription and then I, I, I one day I kind of went through all of my collection because I'm one of those people that saves all her magazines and realized that there had not been one black face. Mm -hmm. And yet I knew that there were black farmers. I knew there were black cooks. I knew there were black people who black people who grew roses, mm -hmm. uh, black people who, I mean, I knew that. Do you, do you know what I mean? And I actually wrote to them and said, you know, I'm really sorry, but uh, your publication it really, you know, it doesn't include me when it could so easily include me. Mm -hmm. So fuck you and <laughs> your prescription and your subscription. Um, so we have to be fairly, we have to put our bullshit meters on and be cynical about when we read a thing, an article, a, 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 a come on, a, a, an appeal, who is it? What is their interest in you doing that, in you following their way? I mean, a person like, say, David Avocado Wolf, who was a complete con shill man, if you click down through his material, you would see, you would understand that. Um, almost everybody who has a point of view, not almost everybody, many, many people who have these very didactic points of view, they're selling something. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, they're selling you an herbal this or a, or they're being sponsored by a company that has something to sell you. Well, I don't know. You know, I mean, I'd, I'd want to know the research about that. Well, as long as these people reject research as a viable means of scientific inquiry, and then have the notion that, well, you know, 99,000 scientists say that this is fine, and three say that it's shitty, and I'm going to go with the three. <laughs> that's, um, you know, that's not using your noggin there too much. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's wishful thinking. It's fantasy. Well, so I'm a, I'm a, that's well, kind I'm of a, my rant a, on that. Have, we got one more question, and then we'll get late. Okay. It's late. Um, I do um, love all of you, people, though. I'm so thrilled to be here. I can hardly bear it. <laughs> man, I'm so happy. This has been so good. Happy. This has been so good. Um, um, is there power in eating food that your ancestors ate generations, generations ago? I.e., I, 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 if you're from South America, Maka, Chia, 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 if you're from Eastern Europe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's, that's kind of the, that's, that's, that's kind of the line I know that that's, line yeah, it's kind of the homeopathic view of, of food, you know, a little bit of this. And we have all, you know, the gene to, to, um, to, to use lactose um, and, and drink milk appears to have spontaneously occur, um, occurred in about three different places among the Western, among the Eastern Maasai, among um, the Scandinavians, and in some German groups uh, over, but about 6,000 years ago. So we're all really, you know, we're still genetically changing and we've all been intermixed and all been, so no, uh, none of us know who the hell our ancestors are is actually the thing. And just having, knowing who our great grandparents were, our great great grandparents, um, that isn't very useful. And, you know, the whole notion of paleo and all of those, they're kind of, they're just wonderful fantasies that have absolutely nothing to do with real life. Is, uh, you can eat a garbanzo, don't worry about it. You don't have to be, a, you know, an Italian to eat one. Uh, partly because at least six to eight, maybe 10, 15 different cultures over about a 10,000 year period, eight ate all that stuff. They ate almonds and lemons and all the stuff from the old world. Everybody ate whatever they could get hold of. And it doesn't do us, other than psychologically, if it pleases you to eat food that you feel 
comes from your culture, whatever that means. And how far back almost any of us can trace our culture is already so fluid that, you know, I mean, remember Italy only became a nation in the 20th century. Before that, it was about 17 different you know, principalities that are all had been overrun by every form of French, Visigoth, Byzantine, Turk, Greek, you know, I mean, when when do we when do we get to dis, you know when uh, when do we land on the culture that we feel is us? You see what I mean? Now, and I'm saying this as you know a, a mixed race person who has you know I have pictures of my of my my black ancestors who lived in South Carolina, and so I know they ate a lot of rice. Well, you know, shit, I eat a lot of rice, but I don't eat it because they ate it. I eat it because I like it. You know, and because I learned to cook from a man from New Orleans who taught me how to make rice. So, you know, I, I think it c can become an affectation. Uh, and I think it's kind of a placebo effect. Uh, I mean, just to be blunt, we need to eat good all round food. If you can grow some of it, that's wonderful. If you can preserve some of it, that's wonderful. If you have to pay other people to do those things, then pay them fairly and hope that they uh, find out how they process it so that it's good for you. Um, learn to just make good food, good standard, ordinary, daily food. And uh, eat meat, it's good for you. Yeah. Eat butter, yogurt, yeah. whole milk, you know. That whole bullshit for SNAP and all of that with the 2% milk, I could just kill them motherfuckers. It's just, they have destroyed the health of so many children. Children all need whole milk for health. And the idea that they would deprive, I mean, why is it suddenly at two, you don't need whole milk? When cultures that drink milk and who have done so for the past several thousands of years um, flourish on it flourish on whole milk. The Maasai is a really good example. And the Hava. That's a really good point. That's anyway, a really good point. Yeah. It's, um, I don't think we, we just, you know, uh, we just got to make sense, you know? Yeah, I got to make it make sense. Yeah, I got to make it make sense. <laughs> I'm sorry yeah. for the echo. I'm, I'm sorry for the echo. Thing is doing, no, not bothering me. Um, um, I'm still trying to figure I'm this out. Trying to figure this thing out too. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, for the folks that's on the call, the folks on the call, uh, maybe we got time. Uh, for maybe we got time for a few questions. A few questions. Uh, and then, uh, you know, and then, then we'll go ahead, ahead and turn this thing in. So anybody want to chime in with some questions? Anybody want to chime in with some questions? Everybody went to Starbucks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so I much. much. You're so welcome. Thank you for being with us, with me. Man, this is fabulous. Man, this is fabulous. Um, I just want to thank you. I just want to do you. this out in my garden. That's what I was Later. about to say. We got to do this again. We got to do this again. out in the, in, the in the world. Like, or somehow or set it up in like my that. kitchen and I'll cook for you. That will be but, that super dope. Super let, dope. Me, let me just take the moment. My website is www.indigohouse.us. And if you go there, you can subscribe to my free monthly email newsletter it's a little bit of memoir about a, a particular food and a, a recipe it's two pages um and uh next this month uh it's gonna be charlie bruce too last month was i think applesauce cake anyway there's it, it's some fun recipes you might enjoy them uh i hope and i hope you will share my um my website with people if you find it uh enjoyable i'm trying to develop uh a digital um, present so that I can have subscribers at modest, very modest subscriptions so that that will help me because as I told Duran and I will tell you, 
uh, with this situation of the of the virus, I lost all of my um, historic dinners, which I have at my house, my classes, which I have at my house, and all of my lectures. Um, so I'm really working hard to figure out a way of bringing in an income over and above my social security. So that I'm just being totally frank about where I'm at so that any of your suggestions help support just good words. Uh, there's a place there that you can email me from my website and, uh, I would uh, love to, it would be wonderful to meet each and every one of you and maybe we will have a day when we can do that. But until then, uh, just keep in touch with me. Oh, what's, the, web, like what's, what's web, the website link? What's the website link? I put it in Excuse chat. Excuse me? I put it in chat. What's your, yes, uh, it's website, w what's your uh, website www.indigohouse.us. And my Vimeo will be vimeo.com front slash Indigo House. All right. Um, All right. Um, I just put it in the chat. I just put it in the chat. Okay. And I'm working on it. I'm new at it. Anybody has suggestions on how to make it better, how to work the technology? I am always open for suggestions and help because ain't none of us doing any of this stuff alone, actually, even if we're right now alone. There's one more question, though. There's one more question, though. Yeah. 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 Because I like it. Okay. It's, it's a really good question. Uh, in what uh, ways in what have ways you seen Southern you food ways Southern food and historic foods, and historic foods be, part of the be part of the discussion of culturally of appropriate, culturally foods, appropriate foods, foods in, the, in, the, in, in this food, moment in the, in as, this a part moment, of food justice as a part of food justice and food sovereignty? And food sovereignty. Well, that's a whole dissertation, that's and I hope whole, that you do write whole, that whole, dissertation. Whole. Right. It's a wonderful <laughs> question, but very briefly, I think the resurgence of interest in Southern foods has been um, really uh, helped a lot of people who felt, who have felt uh, perhaps embarrassment at being, um, having Southern roots, at liking certain kinds of things, at being amused by certain kinds of things. Um, I think we can be Southern without being racist. I think we can be Southern without being Afrocentrist. I think we can be Southern. Um, remember, I'm not Southern. I'm from Southern California. That's about as Southern, except that I have Southern roots. My grandmother was born in Alabama in 1889. My grandfather was born in Texas in, in 1870. Uh, and so I, I feel for this place, and I've lived here a long time, and I think that this, um, because the climate has allowed longer production of food, it has this rich um, uh, and very complex uh, history of food, along with the complexities of the different groups that have been involved. Uh, everything from Black Americans, Native Americans, immigrant Americans, white Americans. It, it, we have necessarily merged in a lot of different ways over the, you know, the 20th century is a hell of a time and that we've lived through. And uh, it's uh, having this fascinating, having this discussion about food, I think is really valuable. It allows us to talk about so many things, inequities, um, I was talking to someone, I'll just be very brief. I talked to a woman who was, I asked her what she did and she said, well, she works with elders to help them improve their diets, especially elders who live alone. And I was saying, well, you know, I, what has always struck me about uh, many kinds of people who uh, live on very deficient diets is that they don't have decent kitchens. They have, people might uh, not have, a, have pans. They might have one burner. On a stove, on a stove, they might have a refrigerator that the 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 um, seal on the refrigerator hasn't been replaced since 1952, and they can't keep anything cold in the refrigerator. So everything that they buy spoils in a day or two, and it's like an old ice box. You know, mm -hmm. they don't have they've got um, vermin in their kitchen. They uh, when we ask people to eat well or to eat better. We have to also do that political act. And this is you know, why I, I, I love you so much, Joanne, is that you would ask that question is, 
how's he going to cook that food? Mm. Where is he going to cook that food? Mm. Mm. Not all that nutrition, vegan bullshit. Is it organic? Mm. But does he have mm. a pan? Does he have, <laughs> do you, you know what I mean? Does he, exactly. does he have, does he even have a kitchen? Does he even have a, a, kitchen? Does does he even have a goddamn oh, kitchen? Oh, right, if you're living, <laughs> if you're living on the homeless thing and they put you in a goddamn motel, you don't have a kitchen. So of course your kids are eating out of the 7-Eleven because there's no other place for you to get any goddamn food. Right. Okay, right. so those yeah. are, those are the questions that we have to be pointed and always remember to ask. Mm -hmm. Never leave them out. Because when we ask them, it makes other people have to respond. Oh, I never, I never thought about that. Of course, you never thought about that. You live in the, you live in Beverly Hills. Why mm. the fuck would you have thought about that? Mm. <laughs> you, see what I mean? you, you know what I mean? Or you live in wherever the fuck you live. Right. It, it's, right. it, it's, we, it is our obligation when we think of that to ask that, mm. and not from a point of view. And I know the answer, and fuck you, but. What about this? Is is this something we also need to be thinking about? And what about that? Can we think about that? And what do you think about that? And how can we add that to the set so it never gets left out? So that mothers on the food stamps, as somebody put out finally on Facebook, don't go to the goddamn store on the first and the second of the month because all the WIC mothers have to go get food. And if you go buy all the cheap shit, then they, all the Wix stuff, they, they can't, can't buy fucking, that. They can't fucking, and so yeah. if they don't have, that's the only food they can get on the Wix. And yeah. if you yeah. have extra money, right. slip that woman $10 so she can buy some sanitary napkins for her and her girls. Right. Okay, because she can't buy that. She can't buy toilet paper. She can't buy dish soap. And so then we're going to talk shit about people who are dirty, in quotes, because they don't have, because they can't afford that stuff, you know. To hear about schools who are finally having sanitary napkins available for these for the for the girls in their schools, right. my God, that's right. something that's 50, 60 years out of uh, should have been happening. Do you see what I mean? We're yeah. now doing. Yeah. We are now doing in many ways now in this crisis, and have just begun to do to understand shit that we could have afforded as a nation, as a culture for 50 fucking years, ever since the war on poverty. Yeah. yeah. So look, man. So look, man. You are my hero. Are my hero. I want to be like you when I grow up. I'm, oh, I, I'm, 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 I'm questing. I'm questing after it. I'm going to cut the beard down and I might be halfway on the path. <laughs> <laughs> look, um, I want to have, I wish you a good night. I'm going to go get some, uh, something to eat. I think I got some food in there. I'm going to try. I have a pork roast. I have a pork, fresh pork ham that came from my pig that I raised over this last year. And it's oh, grazing in the oven as I speak with potatoes and carrots. And I'm going to go tear that thing apart because I got oh, some tortillas. God. Oh my God. Pork. So. So anyway. Night. Oh, I'm like. I have an applesauce cake, so, uh, so uh, there. applesauce cake. Yes, with cream cheese frosting. Oh fuck! Check. check my <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, I'm, just, boy. I'm, I'm just saying here. That's what I've been doing today. We're gonna have to get together on that video on the on the cooking video. We're gonna have to do that next. But look, you have, have a good night. Good night. Uh, good night, and thank you. I appreciate you. you. And I'm going to see you the video of this. I'm going to see you the video of this. Uh, uh, processes or whatever. Okay, whatever. let's make a Dropbox. Or how does it come? Zipped? Yeah, I'm going to put it in. I'm going to give you the link. You'll just be able to download. You'll just be able to download. Wonderful. Absolutely fine. Super. Good night, all. Take care. And go take care of you. Stay home. Stay the fuck home, as they say. <laughs> Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Ariel, Anna, James, Duran, Tyler, <laughs> Nick. Good night, everybody. Katie. Goodbye. Oh, did you get your your pay? Did you get your 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 uh, rent pay? Oh yes. Yes. Okay. Good for you. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I've been out on the street for a month now. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> See you guys later. Take care. Bye-bye.